thank you and a very warm welcome to this uh, extremely pertinent debate wherever you are uh, we're delighted that you've joined us to talk about inequality something that afflicts i think every country in the world and i think most of us politicians and commentators included would say that they were in favor of reducing levels of inequality Yet this sentiment doesn't seem to have much impact on the reality, which, amongst other signs, is that the average person in the 10 richest countries of the world spends in a single week more than those in the poorest 10 earn in a year. And even in rapidly growing economies like India, greater prosperity has gone hand in hand with increasing inequality. So should we conclude that we don't, in fact, believe in reducing inequality, but we simply want to be attached to the moral intent without any serious plan to deliver it? Is there an economic solution that can enable greater prosperity, but also reduce inequality? Or must we redouble our efforts to rectify the situation? And would that require accepting radical changes in our lifestyles? Well, we have a brilliant panel to tackle these difficult questions, and I'm delighted to uh, introduce the Nobel Prize winning econ economist, public intellectual, uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz. He is a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank and is currently a professor at Columbia University. I'm also joined by Grace Blakely, who is an economics commentator, a former researcher at the Institute for Public Policy Research and the author of Corona Crash, How the Pandemic Will Change Capitalism, and Lisa Nandy. Lisa has held a number of shadow cabinet posts and is now the shadow foreign secretary. Welcome to all of you. And I'm going to start by asking each of you to, uh, I guess, tackle this this conundrum which, which I've, I've referred to, which is that although we claim to believe in reducing global inequality, our, our kind of lack of effect might suggest we don't mean it. And perhaps we should admit that we don't really believe it. Um, so Grace, kick us off. Sure. Um, well, for me, the main point that I want to be the takeaway from this talk is that inequality is about power. And because it's about power, it's also about class. Um, and I think that's basically what's missing from the discussion that we have about, about uh, inequality in the mainstream, because the, our narratives around, around inequality, whether you're talking about that at the domestic level or internationally, and it's interesting the way in which those conversations are often divorced from one another. I'll come back to that in a, in a minute or so. But the, the narratives we use to talk about inequality are individualized. And that's because the discipline of economics is founded upon uh, assumptions about individuals. So individuals are kind of, you know, rational utility maximizing agents bumping up against one another in, in free markets. And inequality arises as a kind of natural um, dispersion of uh, rewards for people who, you know, work, some work harder than others, some are better than others, you know, um, and some just simply are able to access certain resources because they are born into the right place at the right time, etc. It's all about the privileges um, or lack of privileges that are conferred on individuals. Now, economics is not a discipline today, especially kind of in the mainstream in neoclassical economics, it's not a discipline that tends to talk much about class. But coming at this from um, a, a kind of critical perspective allows you to understand that obviously, you know, capitalism as an economic system is a system that divides uh, people into basically two groups. Either you own capital, either you own the stuff that is needed to produce things, or you are forced to sell your wage uh, for um, a living. Uh, and that obviously gives us one measure, measure of inequality, which is the uh, labor share of national income versus the profit share of national income. And what we've seen in uh, economies uh, really kind of, you know, particularly in, in advanced economies, but in many economies around the world, is that, that in, especially over the last 40 years, the profit share has increased. But you also get inequality within the labor share uh, because of the way in which um, you kind of get a level, especially under kind of modern um, uh, globalized and financialized capitalism, you get um, a... Uh, an increasing dispersion within the wage share that's to do with rewards for different roles that are undertaken within the production process. Now, I'll come back to this a bit later, but effectively, if you are analyzing global inequality using this class lens, what you're quickly able to see is that the global working class has effectively been offshored to the global south. That is where the vast majority of production takes place. And a lot of the better paid jobs in the rich world are effectively to do with managing global production. 
to do with speculating over value that's created elsewhere. They're to do with managing uh, value change. They're to do with, you know, managing personnel. Um, and that is, you know, a, a significant reason for uh, that, you know, internal dispersion in, uh, in incomes within uh, the wage share. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think coming at this from the perspective of class and from the perspective of class power allows you to see some of those things that you maybe miss when you look at things from a more individualized perspective. And I think that is why, because, you know, often our discussion about inequality, whether you're talking about domestic or, or global inequality, we compare, and Thomas Piketty obviously did this in his book Capital, the kind of neoliberal era, so the period between the 1980s and, uh, you know, broadly the financial crisis, and the period that preceded that, so the post-war consensus, the trente glorieuses, whatever you want to call them, uh, which was a period where, particularly in the rich world, you saw kind of falling inequality, um, you saw... Uh, you know, a, a fairly more stable economic system, which had a much greater role for state intervention. And when we talk about this, often, especially, um, you know, when we're thinking about ways to solve inequality, we look back and we think, well, the reason for that was obviously we had Keynesian economic policy. We had the Bretton Woods institutions that, um, you know, constrained the power of finance capital that, um, you know, constrained the size of finance sectors domestically and therefore limited the amount of kind of extraction um, that could take place via those mechanisms. Um, and, you know, we talk about all these Keynesian policies and think, oh, well, if we brought those back, then things would be better. But I think that misses a step, which is that why did we get those Keynesian policies to begin with? Well, it was because there was a redistribution of power between capital and labor that took place in the aftermath of the Second World War, which obviously occurred for a number of reasons. You get much important, much more important role for unions during the Second World War because of the needs of, of production during, in the war economy. Uh, and you get a state that's much bigger and that requires much greater taxation on wealthy individuals to be able to pay for that war effort, which again sh uh, helps to shift that, that balance of power. So I think great. the lesson from that... Great. I think we, we're going to come back to a number of those themes and, and I'm, I, I'd like to you know, get, get round in our first round. So I'm going to stop you there, if that's all right. Of course, and, yeah. And ask Lisa the same question, which is this conundrum that we say we're in favour of inequality. Inequality persists. Shouldn't we admit that we don't really believe in reducing it? Um, well, the short answer to that, as you would expect, is no, I don't think that we should. And the reason for that is because inequality isn't just bad for, to borrow a phrase, those who are less equal than others. It's bad for everybody, both at a national level and a global level. The excessive concentration of power, as Grace said, of wealth, of opportunity is unjustifiable, but it's also dis disruptive because more equal societies are stronger they're kinder they're healthier and a more equal world is a world that is more hopeful and more secure both within countries and across the world inequality is a problem for all of us and we can and should try to address it however difficult that is but i think to change this we need to think differently about the causes of inequality sometimes i think we target the wrong people in the debate for example fast fashion is rightly condemned for exploitation and wastefulness um, and our response is often ethical consumerism which is fine as far as it goes but the blame for the excesses of the fast fashion industry don't lie with people in Britain whose incomes have fallen in recent years who, who turn to Primark in order to clothe their children we won't solve this problem by pitting working people in Bangladesh against working people in Bolton solidarity is part of the answer not part of the problem and the problem is a system that allows some people to benefit disproportionately from an industry that is built on a model that pushes down costs that suppresses labor rights and that abuses human rights so we need to focus on the drivers of the system and the structures that sustain it from how and what we tax, as Joseph has written about, to how we regulate finance and the rights that workers have as well. Behind this, I think, is a model of, of global trade and finance, which creates imbalances in the world economy, which have profound consequences for us all. Countries will cut consumption, um, they'll tax working people more, for example, or they'll cut social security payments in order to pay for investment, which facilitates growth. Now, the best example of that model in recent times, I think, is China, um, which has harmed those workers in China who cannot now afford to consume the things that they produce. But what it also does is it builds these big surpluses that have to find a market elsewhere in the world. And by flooding other markets with cheap goods, other workers in other countries are disadvantaged too. We've seen this with workers in the Rust Belt in America. It creates rising tensions between countries and it fuels populism too. It is bad for all of us. 
So my view is that we need a global system that works in the interests of working people, that promotes trade unions, labour rights, living standards and raises transparency in global supply change. But my view is also that this starts at home, where our major challenge is to decouple growth from rising inequality and carbon consumption, the two twin challenges for our economy. We need an industrial policy that invests in green economies. We need real action on pay. And that, by the way, means overcoming this divide in value and status between high and low skilled jobs. How can it possibly be, for example, in the middle of a global pandemic, that care workers are deemed low skilled by their own government in this country? We've got to invest in the education and skills of workers and expect companies to do so too. There is a reason that the car industry in the northeast of England is likely to survive Brexit, despite all the damage that even a no-deal Brexit can do, and that is because the skills of the workforce are worth paying for. But until we measure and value the right things, my view is this is not going to change. We obsess about GDP growth rather than about how that growth is distributed or the quality of life that it leads to. We measure everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. But as we've learned through this global pandemic, with all the, the upheaval that it's brought to people's daily lives, if you change the lens through which you see the world, suddenly the things that matter come back into focus again. That's the sentiment that I think we need to rediscover in this debate as we start to think seriously about how we build back better. Thanks, Lisa. And Joseph, let me go straight on to you to this question about this gap between what we say we want and, and actually what, what we don't do. Shouldn't we just admit there's a gap there and recognize it? Oh, there is a gap, obviously. And I, I'm going to take your question at face value. Uh, obviously, uh, people always care more about their family than their community, about their community rather than the broader society and our, our nation, and then uh, that more than they do about the world. Uh, that, that's sort of natural. So there, there's uh, no uh, commitment to complete equality. That's, that's obviously very clear. But I think, uh, especially in Britain, you should be uh, proud of the fact that one of the things that... Uh, governments in both parties have done as, as you face some budget constraints, you did do some protecting over the overseas development budget uh, of the ODA budget. And so you did more than a lot of other countries in the UK, you did make a commitment, not fully uh, realized and a lot of it going to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, very special circumstances, you did make some commitment more than others to uh, redistribution across boundaries. But there are two other points that I think have already been raised that I just want to highlight. Um, the first is, uh, this is not a zero sum, and that it is in our self-interest to have some redistribution that uh, the global economy is weaker when there's more inequality, just like the national economy is weaker. You know, that, that was reflected in the book that I uh, wrote called The Price of Inequality. We pay a high price of inequality within our boundaries nationally, and we do that globally. And secondly... Um, to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.